Hi, everyone. Again, I am thrilled to introduce Jean Neary, the award-winning author of many amazing books for young readers, including the Coretta Scott King honor-winning graphic novel, Yummy, the middle grade novel, Ghetto Cowboy, now a film on Netflix called Concrete Cowboy, starring Caleb McLaughlin and Idris Elba, and the picture book biographies, Hello, I'm Johnny Cash and When Paul Met Artie. Greg is a wonderful author who excels at telling stories inspired by real life that really resonate with young readers. Like some of his characters, he's a cowboy at heart, roaming the rugged frontiers of the world, and that's where he gets his inspiration for many of his stories. In fact, recently he took a National Science Foundation funded trip to Antarctica, and he's currently working on a project based on that experience. Greg's newest book coming this fall is a sequel to Ghetto Cowboy called Polo Cowboy, and I'm so excited for all of you to have a chance to read it. He's an incredible writer, an amazing go-getter, and one of the nicest guys you could ever hope to meet. Greg is normally based in Florida, but he's joining us today from Vienna, Austria. Hi, Greg. <laughs> so you're gonna start by, by reading to us a little bit from Polo Cowboy. Um, and I don't know, do you want to give a little introduction about, about what the book's about before you dive in? Set up. Um, so this is a sequel to Ghetto Cowboy. It literally picks up from the last scene of the first book. And um, I'm, I'm just going to read this chapter, but the setup for it okay. is he's decided, his mother has come to pick him up from Philadelphia, to take him back to Detroit. And the deal was he'll spend the school year in Detroit with mother and summers with dad in Philadelphia. But to her surprise, she discovers he wants to stay in Philadelphia now, even though he hasn't even talked about it with Harper, his dad. So in this scene, he's kind of uh, taken his horse Boo and into Fairmont Park, which is the big park he goes to when he needs to think about things. And uh, he stumbles across the old police barn where they, the police kept their horses and, and that barn played a big role in the first book when they confiscated his horse Boo and they had to go rescue him and all this drama and they find it completely empty. So in this scene, Boo is running around this empty corral and Cole is kind of daydreaming about what it'd be like for Boo to have a place like this rather than the rundown stable that he's in, which is kind of a makeshift, you know, empty building turned into a stable. And then he hears a noise. I'm sitting there dreaming about what I could do with the place when I hear some kind of strange noise. Thwack, bang, thwack, bang, thwack, bang. What's that? I leave Boo at the trough and follow the sound out the corral. It seemed to be coming from the other side of the barn. The barn is big, so it takes me a few minutes to walk around the edges. The sound is getting louder, and then when I come up on a corner, I start hearing a voice too, a girl's voice, counting. Thwack, bang, 22. Thwack, bang, 23. When I peek around the corner, I see the weirdest thing, a girl sitting on a sawhorse with a piece of cardboard for a saddle, holding the reins like it's a real horse or something. She's hitting red softballs with a long wood hammer. She takes a swing at one of them balls. Thwack! It sails through the air and hits a square chopped on the side of the barn. Bang! 24, she counts. I have no idea what she's doing, but I watch her hit a few more. She's dressed funny, too. Wearing a helmet and on her arms and knees is leather pads. On her feet, she's wearing long black boots that cover her calves. She got on white pants and a dark shirt that says one word, chuck her head. When she runs out of balls, she climbs down off of that thing and starts collecting the, the loose ones in a basket. And then she puts the basket at the foot of her horse and takes off her helmet. Oh, dang. She about my age, but her face, it looks like she's made up for Halloween or something. Her skin is dark like mine. But around her eyes, nose, and mouth is painted like white. Like she just dipped the front of her head in a bowl of paint or something. It's not polite to stare, she said suddenly. I look around and realize she's talking to me. I wasn't staring, I say, even though I was. 
I mean, I just heard a noise and came around to check it out. She's looking at me, but the whole mask thing is freaking me out because it ain't paint. It's her skin. I try to change the subject. What happened to the mounted police, I ask. I mean, last time I was here, they kept all of their horses in the stable. She dumps the basket of balls. They're gone, close the program. Really, why? She climbs back up on her wood horse. Mom says it costs the city too much to feed them and clean up after them. She aims and takes a swing at a ball. Thwack, bang, 26. I think he was on 25, I say. She ignores me, but on the next hit, thwack, bang, she says 26 with attitude. I watch her take a few more whacks. What are you doing, I ask. What's it look like? Practicing my half seat trunk rotation. You what? She laughs. Polo dummy. Only polo I know is them shirts some kids wear around. Like Ralph Lauren polo? She stops and looks at me like I'm stupid. If you're gonna stand there, make yourself useful. Get those balls for me, will you? I don't know why, but I do it. I hustle over to where a couple of balls sit near the barn wall. Can I ask you a question? Thwack, a ball sails by just missing my head. Bang, hey, I shout. She stares me down hard then points to her face. It's called vitiligo if you gotta know, she says. It's a disease that causes the loss of skin color. So no, I'm not dressed like a clown for Halloween and I'm not part Dalmatian, okay? I pick up the balls and walk over to where she is and dump them. I was just gonna ask you what a chuckerhead is, I say. She kind of laughs like she ain't sure if I'm lying or not. Finally, she says, a chuckerhead is anyone who loves polo. I never seen anyone play polo except for a polo game I saw on TV once, but it was in a pool and there were no wood horses or hammer sticks, I say. I did play Marco Polo once, but that was in a pool too. Now she just looks sorry for me. Are you like simple in the head or something? And by the way, these aren't hammer sticks. They're called mallets. And she suddenly stops talking and her expression changes. I hear Boo amble up behind me. He starts nibbling at the back of my head. That your pony, she asks. So that's just kind of the opening between the two main characters here in this unusual uh, idea for a sequel, I would say. <laughs> Definitely unusual. Unusual, but intriguing. I mean, I, how, how did you get the idea to bring Polo to, to Cole's world? Yeah, it, it was not the obvious choice, but what happened after the first book came out uh, and I was doing school visits all over. Um, kids were kept asking, like, when are you going to do the next one, the next sequel? And I would always say, well, you know, usually to do a sequel, I need another idea. And I don't really know where to go with this. And, you know, one kid kind of kept on me. And he's like, I know what you should write about. And I'm like, sure, let's hear it. And it turned out he was from uh, Fletcher Street, which is the neighborhood, you know, where the original story takes place. But he had kind of, he was living in two worlds because secretly he was also a polo player. And there was this barn uh, in Fairmont Park that housed the only African-American polo team. And that in itself is an epic story, how they went from being kind of the bad news bears to national champions. Um, but I was intrigued because the, the main star of that world, um, who I knew a little bit, uh, when we were filming the movie Concrete Cowboy, he showed up on set dressed as a cowboy. And I thought that was odd because the polo and cowboy worlds never cross. And he had been hired to be uh, Idris's, Idris Elba's stunt double. So he was dressed like Idris and had a little gray beard, even though he was in his late twenties. Um, and and he had also gone to this military academy that had been the rivals for this team in Fairmont Park. And so I kind of was intrigued by this, these two worlds that both have horses, but they're completely different worlds and never do cross. And I like the idea of Cole falling for a girl from that world 
and it was kind of to me it was kind of like West Side Story you know two separate worlds and starstruck lovers kind of crossing and uh, you know the cowboy world's more like tough you know street and polo you know if you know anything about polo it's very posh elite sport so totally different aesthetics going on yeah well except as cole soon learns right that there there there's nothing soft about polo no. <laughs> it's actually one of the most dangerous sport. sports as she as this girl ruthie says you know imagine trying to hit this tiny ball with a a wood hammer that's three feet long and you're on top of a thousand pound beast charging in a pack with you know five other thousand pound beasts you know bumping and scraping each other and you're going 30 miles an hour trying to hit this little ball leaning halfway off you know and you could easily get knocked off you could easily get trampled you could get whacked by a mallet or a ball or you know it's all crazy that's why you know they literally have to wear this armor you know the helmet the cage and the elbows and everything so it's it's actually pretty exciting sport but there's a lot of back and forth about that you know which is like you know which is the tougher it's kind of like i always thought of it in the beginning as hockey versus figure skating and you think oh, oh right. figure but you know figure skating is pretty dangerous <laughs> if you actually look at it and do you think, so now are you going to get the question, I mean, is there something else for Cole after this? Is there going to be a, a Well, there was a, there was a story recently in the Washington Post that people have been like, oh, that sounds like a perfect <laughs> trilogy, uh, which is about bull riding, <laughs> about this black kid who became a, a bull riding champion, you know. Wow. And he, uh, it happens to be in Pennsylvania, so it's like. <laughs> it's like, like um, the world is just serving it up to you on a platter, Greg. I can't go there yet. I can't go there yet. <laughs> no. Wow. And what, so, so you came up with the idea for this story and then how did you get the idea to give Ruthie vitiligo? Because um, that's something yes. that, that. So um, interesting. this group in the park, this polo team was having a fundraiser that I went to. And it was a, it was across in Bucks County, which is very posh kind of horse country. So a lot of rich people. It's at a, at a really fancy polo grounds, and you know people are drinking champagne and stuff like this, and they're trying to raise money. And I saw this girl who had vitiligo, like a pretty dramatic case of it, and she was manning one of the booths. But I was like really impressed, like how kind of open and like she was totally working it and you know, like talking with all these, she was, you know, maybe eight, 17, 18, but she, and talking to all these fancy adults, but she totally held her own. And I tried to, you know, I was like really impressed. And then later I saw her kind of resting kind of away from the action. And, you know, I could kind of see like how much energy that took knowing that everybody who saw you, including me, like notices you in a crowd of hundreds of people like you pop out so not only in the story is she uh well I should say you know Cole Cole Harper's uh one stipulation is that he get a job and he gets Cole a job at this military academy in the barn there taking care of their horses where where you know she ends up ends up meeting Ruthie more and um you know, so not only is Ruthie part of this academy, like she's the first girl, um, she's the first black girl, and then she has this skin condition and, you know, she's on the polo team. So she's totally outnumbered and outmanned and, and just like, um, so she has a lot going against her. So it's kind of really a story about two outsiders trying to hold their own. And, and there's such a tender, um, tender romance, I mean, friendship and, and, and the starts of a romance between them. It's really, um, it's really perfect for this age group. It's not like, you know, over the top, but it's fun to see. It's fun to see Cole um, <laughs> getting kind of smitten. <laughs> yeah, you know, because you're like 14 and, and it's kind of like this awkward age where you're not, you're not supposed to own up like you're interested in a girl and but it's even trickier if you're interested in a girl who has like these physical issues that everyone else is going to notice and so you're fighting these two conflicting things which is like 
you're, you're kind of ashamed to be staring at her or noticing her or you don't want to like acknowledge that she's different and yet she is you know so it's like it's awkward enough just being 14 and doing that but then it's like you elevate it against all these other things and it's like a lot of drama going on <laughs> for sure for sure so so these stories all take place in Philadelphia and you've spent some time down there and, and gotten to know some of the cowboys. And can you talk a little bit about that and uh, yeah. and the, just the experience of it? Yeah, so uh, Fletcher Street is where these, the stable is that is, you know, was inspired the stable and the, the story. And Strawberry Mansion is the neighborhood and, and most people consider it the most dangerous part of Philadelphia. And so nobody ever knew there was a whole world of black cowboys going on there just because, you know, anyone who lived outside of that neighborhood, you know, did their best to avoid it at all costs. And even people I knew who lived two miles away had no idea. Um, and to me, it was pretty special because not, you know, what they were doing was they were saving horses who were literally being sent to the slaughterhouse and then bringing them back to this neighborhood and rehabbing them, bringing them back to life and then turning around and giving the horses to kids in the neighborhood with the idea, you know, if, if you own your own horse, it's a full-time job. You don't have time to get in trouble, you know? And plus you put a kid up on a horse, even in a tough neighborhood or especially in a tough neighborhood, you know, you get a lot of instant respect because People literally have to look up to you and nobody's going to mess with you when you're on a horse. Uh, and they get a real sense of self-worth, you know, like their reputation is based on their horse and how well they take care of their horse and how well they ride. Um, so it becomes a real close bond between, you know, a young person and an animal where you're learning all kinds of responsibility and things like that. So, you know, the first book came out of just wanting to represent it because it, it was something unique and special, um, but it was also in danger because the city was trying to drive them out basically uh, because they wanted to gentrify the neighborhood. And they had basically taken over vacant lots and empty uh, buildings that had just been crumbling and turned them into something. And now, you know, they wanted to tear all that down, but they couldn't just drive them off like the old West days. So there's been this kind of showdown and so part of the thing for both books is to kind of change the narrative by showing how special this world is and that in fact this is something that should be embraced and celebrated and certainly since the movie came out or even when we were filming it you could see how philadelphia started at least the media started to embrace it as something really cool and special uh, and unique to the city and now that it's gone global i mean be open in 190 countries around the world. So even here in Austria, you know, I ran into people who didn't know I, you know, that was my movie and they had just watched it, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> so it's like, and, you know, and rate, being able to raise a lot of money to save the barn and, and start a fund to eventually build a barn in the park that can't be gentrified or destroyed. So it's been quite a journey. And, and you mentioned filming the movie that was filmed, a lot of it was filmed on location. Yeah, it was filmed all on the actual locations, uh, like the first time those neighborhoods had ever been shot for a film. And what was really meta and strange was, you know, we were shooting in the actual locations that inspired the story and the people who inspired the characters were all there on set every day. You know, some of the people from the neighborhood were in the film, some of them were behind the film, and they would just, you know, even, be, you know, right before a take was about to happen, they would walk up right up to Idris Elba or whatever and start talking to him without even going to the director or anybody. Just, you know, the message was always to keep it, you know, 100% real. And so they developed this relationship, you know, just like, look, this is how you got to play it. <laughs> You know, this is what we would do. And so it was like, oh, okay. Um, and for me, it was really weird just to see the real people and then these actors playing these characters based on these people and the actual place. So it's really kind of this weird meta experience, but like a real beautiful community 
event, you know, like they all turned out, you know, the whole community and they were involved in a lot of different ways. Oh, and that really shines through in the movie, like just watching it, it feels there is an authenticity to it that I think, um, you know, probably comes from that connection to the neighborhood. Yeah, and the filmmakers were also from that neighborhood too, so that's what made it extra special, like they already knew them and had already filmed a couple of short pieces about them, and so, you know, it was kind of like a, a very local uh, uh, project. That's amazing. Um, let's take some questions. We have a few questions here. Um, so um, Sonia Adams asks, uh, Mr. Neary, are there creatives, influencers, and or authors that inspire your writing craft? Well, you know, I would say what inspires me more is, are like these writers I meet. And it's not so much their writing style, but it is them as people. So I could say people like Kate Camillo or M.T. Anderson. Um, like I see how, and I've been out in at festivals and things and conferences with them or whatever, and I see how they treat their readers, you know, and and how they treat other authors. And I was always surprised, like when they immediately treated me in the beginning like equals, because I always thought like, oh, you know. But it's like, as soon as you're a writer, like you're on the same boat. And so it taught me a lot about how to not only treat the readers, but to how to treat other writers. And also I saw how special it was the relationship with educators and librarians who have been really, really key for me and my books. Um, so to me, those that's the way other writers have influence me and to be honest like I'm so busy I don't have time to read <laughs> like I'm friends with a lot of people who you know I've never read any of their stuff because I just don't have the time and if I do read I'm reading nonfiction because I'm doing you know research or whatever and so it's always the people it's always real life that inspires me yeah Okay, and then Gary Anderson asks, um, well, says, thank you, Greg, for doing this today. The sequel sounds great as well as the bull riding possibility. Um, he says, I wonder if you have any more musical biography picture books in the works and how you choose the subjects of those projects. Ooh, the yeah. musical biographies. Well, there was one um, which still remains in the hamper, as they say, um, but, you know, I can mention the other book that we're doing together is about Christo and Jean-Claude, the artists. Um, and that kind of came about the same way, which is, I mean, story about Johnny Cash and Simon and Garfunkel was less about their music in the beginning and more about coming across their story as young people. And just like all these things I never knew about them. I mean, I knew the famous personas, but I never knew you know, where they came from. I never knew that, you know, Paul and Artie grew up as best friends, you know, from sixth grade on. And, you know, the life of Johnny Cash as a kid leading up to the birth of rock and roll and all, you know, all these crazy stories. So it really developed out of, you know, just stories that have not been told yet. And for the Crystal one, it's really about um, not only their story, but also the bigger question of like, what is art and who gets to make it, which is really at the heart of all their projects, uh, really challenges that question. Um, so yeah, but I am always intrigued by this. I will always come across musicians like, hmm, that would be, like nobody's done that book yet, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I feel like, um... For you, like the world is kind of like uh, like it's a candy know. store. It's a candy. It store. is. It really like, is. And you're just what's that? The, <laughs> the stories, and then and then working your magic on them. It really yeah. is incredible. I'm trying. Um, okay, Lindsay asks, uh, do you have a favorite line or chapter from the book? The new book. Um, well, there is a chapter I really like. Um, I don't know what chapter it is, but um, it's the scene where they have, where she challenges him. Cause he's always like, 
being friendly with her and everything, but he always averts his eyes because he doesn't want to stare. Because as soon as he looks at her face, she, he's staring at her face, you know, and he knows that that's a bad thing. But by not looking at her too, it's also disrespectful. So it's like this. So she challenges him to really look at her face. And at the same time, she's looking at his face for the first time too. Um, because, you know, uh, he's always <laughs> looking down or away. And so I think that's kind of the first moment where they really start to see each other for real. So to me, that was always like the key scene to the whole book. Yeah, no, that's one of my favorites for sure, too. Um, uh, Jane asks, um, do you ride horses yourself? <laughs> I always like to say, I'm a rider, not a rider. Um, <laughs> I do come from a horse family. I have a, a cousin who's a horse trainer who's the star of my graphic novel, Grand Theft Horse, and an uncle who, you know, rode horses in the Rose Parade, and, and a cousin and, and in-law who, who have horses too. Um, I mean, I can ride, but I don't, you know, I'm nothing, <laughs> nothing to write home about. <laughs> Have you, have you tried polo? Is that? I have definitely not tried polo. I mean, I was going to sign up for lessons, mm -hmm. um, and then it just didn't work out. <laughs> I the other thing I learned too is, you know, as, as soon as you write a book about something, whether it's chess or this, but especially because I've written more than one book about horses, you know, everybody's going to assume you're an expert horse rider, and they're going to like, okay, let's go for a ride. And, you know, they're going to do some crazy thing. You're going to race or whatever. And then, you know, so I have to like cop up, you know, it's like, that's, that's what a writer does. It's like makes it, you, you should think I'm an expert horse rider if I do right. my job, but I am not. <laughs> well, you get expert readers to review. Yes, ex exactly. So, um, yeah. so hopefully, uh, um, and uh, Beth asks, um, what do you hope young readers take away from these books from Ghetto Yeah, Cohen? you know, well, one thing, especially with the relationship between Cole and Ruthie is that, you know, every, you know, we as humans are quick to judge people based on how they look, how they talk, where they come from, you know, how they dress. And one of the things I'm always trying to do in my books is to kind of strip that away and allow readers to see everyone as humans, despite how they look. Um, and, and so you relate to them as that. By the end of the book, you no longer see that physical difference. Um, and that that is always the goal, is to get people to look past the surface at the, re at the real human inside. Yeah. Um, and then Julie asks, was there any part of the book of Ghetto Cowboy that didn't make it into the movie that you were disappointed about? Oh, I wouldn't say disappointed. I mean, I, I came out of the film world, so I know the difference between a book and a movie. And if you literally film the book straight, it would not work. Um, so you have to make changes. And some of them are really interesting, like taking this old guy called Tex and turning him into an older woman character, helped balance the gender roles, and she became like the mother of the stables. That was very interesting. And, and there are a couple of things in the book that kind of are a precursor to the sequel that we were both writing at the same time, because, you know, I was working on this book, you know, before there was any talk of a movie. And so I think some of it leaked in, in terms of there's a girl character girl cowboy who's kind of like a, a love interest even though it's not dealt with deeply or anything um and then um and the, the playing out smush's story in a bigger way which is concluded in the sequel it was also in the movie um the, the ending is different and you know, it's kind of less, a little less political because in the book, it's much more about civil disobedience and standing up for your rights. And there's a big battle at the end, but sometimes it's, it's practicalities like shooting a scene like that would take this much of the budget. And it's like, 
so sometimes you just got to do kind of like, how can we do that poetically in a different way? That's not going to cost, you know, a quarter of the budget or whatever, um, with this big giant standoff with hundreds of extras and all this stuff. Um, the other thing was like, boo, the horse, uh, is not black in the movie. And it was like, what is going on? Um, but you know, you need the horse to act. You need the horse to do certain things, to do stunts. And the one that they found that could do all that was not a black horse. And, you know, I stopped short of like, could we paint him maybe? <laughs> but, um, you know, so you have to take, do you want the acting or the looks, right? And so some, the filmmaking is all about compromises. But at the end of the day, um, I felt they captured kind of the heart and soul of it. And even though there are things that are different, you know, and he's, he's aged up a bit in the film and things like that, but, you know, I'm pretty happy with it overall. That's great. Well, all the more reason to, to get both, right? Watch the movie and Absolutely. read the book. I feel like it's the best of both worlds. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's three o'clock now, so um, we're going to yeah. wrap this up. Thank you so much for, for coming um, and, and reading and answering questions. Um, it's just a, a real treat to have you. Yeah, it's my um, pleasure. <laughs>